And I'll go to Proverbs chapter 10 for us this morning. And Proverbs is a proverb of Solomon that we're going to talk about. And we're going to go through a majority, actually all of Proverbs chapter 10, but I'm only going to read a little bit at the beginning here to give you a taste of what we're going to talk about, and then we'll go through the remainder of the verses as we go through the message. So Proverbs chapter 10, starting in verse 1, says this. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise man maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for this time and opportunity we have just to open your word and learn from it, Lord. I thank you for just all the wonderful teachings that you have, and I pray, Lord, that you would just give me your words today and just help me to be a blessing to those people that are here today, Lord. If someone's here that's not saved, I pray that you would save them, and ultimately I pray that you just use me in a mighty way. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's four traits that those first few verses of Proverbs talk about, and really that's what we're going to be talking about for the remainder of this message, and I'm going to go through the other verses in Proverbs chapter 10 as well. But those words are wisdom, and righteousness, and diligence, and justness. And that's what we're going to look at today. You know, many people in today's society have three things that we desire. We desire health, we desire wealth, and we desire happiness. That's what almost every person in this world longs for. You can ask someone that's a kid, you can ask someone that is well on in their years, and there's still three things as a human race, as people that we desire, and that's health, wealth, and happiness. The fact that we desire these three things is so strong that they've even made their way into the religious realm under the concept of prosperity gospel. And you can be safe, I'm not going to teach a prosperity gospel this morning. I'm not going to go that direction, so you don't have to pull me off the pulpit, brother. We'll be okay. Um, but that's what we desire. And even the religious bandwagon has jumped on there. And you can go to any store and you can find hundreds of books dedicated to the pursuit of these things. And millions of dollars are spent by people just like you and I trying to get into just a little better position in life. We want health. We want wealth. We want happiness. We can get more education, we switch jobs, we take up new hobbies, we try the latest diet, we listen to a new book on tape, we check out a book from the library, because we as human beings long these three things, health, wealth, and happiness. That's really what many of us in life are striving for. And we may not categorize it just like that, but many of us, the reason we go to work, the reason we put up with that boss, the reason that we do this diet, the reason that we have these hobbies is to fulfill three things, health, wealth, and happiness. And engaging in the pursuit, in this pursuit, the pursuit of health, the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of happiness, as a Christian, is a little different. You know, as a Christian, we should come at this problem with a little bit of a different attitude, I guess. And I want to point out to you that there's a question that we ask ourselves. It's not necessarily, can I get more health? Can I get more wealth? Can I be happier? But there's a question that we as Christians normally pose to ourselves the further along we get on in this Christian life that surrounds these things. And really, many of us get to a point in our lives where we look at the Christian life and we ask ourselves if it adds up. And really, we ask ourselves these three questions. You know, is being a Christian helping me or hurting me physically? What effect does it have on my health? Is being a Christian helping or hurting my finances? You know, giving that 10%, giving that offering, giving to the missions conference. Is that helping or is that hurting my wealth situation? Is being a Christian making me happy? Is going to church three times a week making me happy? Is getting up an hour earlier and praying making me happier? 
How is it affecting my happiness? Would I be happier if I wasn't a Christian? And we may not go through these specific questions. We may not ask these questions to ourselves outright, but usually it comes in the form of this. Is being a Christian worth it? And I know we've asked that question because I've asked myself that question. Is being a Christian worth it? You know what? I got saved. That's great. I go to church. I've learned. That's great. I know how to tithe. I know how to pray. I know how to come to church. You know what? I even get the opportunity to preach now. But is it worth it? I work with a bunch of people that say, no, it's not. And they go out and they golf on Sunday. And they keep that 10%. And you know what? They take vacations. And they buy nice clothes and they drive nice cars. And I have to ask myself sometimes, is it worth it? And I can guarantee you're going to get to a place in your Christian life where you're going to ask, is it worth it? And how you answer that question, yes or no? How you truthfully answer yourself in your heart, by yourself, yes it is worth it or no it's not worth it, is really going to determine unequivocally, indisputably, plainly, how successful you're going to be as a Christian. Is it worth it? Yes or no? That's what we're going to talk about today. The text here in Proverbs 10 gives us some guidelines on whether God thinks being a Christian is worthwhile. And it all ties to those four attributes that can help us in the areas of health, wealth, and happiness. And we're going to tie it all together. But I want you to remember those attributes because we're going to be going through the verses in Proverbs 10. We're going to look for wisdom. We're going to look for righteousness. We're going to look for diligence. And we're going to look for justness. Because if you have those things, that's going to lead you to health and wealth, happiness, and a successful Christian life. So let's look first at wisdom. Let's look first at wisdom. Wisdom is defined as the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. The quality of being wise. I love it when dictionaries do that. They define something as the quality of something. Wisdom is the quality of being wise. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. But having experience, knowledge, good judgment, that's what being wise is. In Proverbs 10, there's several verses that compare and contrast a wise person from, let's just say, a not-so-wise person. Alright? So that's what we're going to look at here. So the first one is right off the bat. Proverbs 10, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is heaviness to his mother. Let's go down to verse 5. He that gathereth in the summer is a wise son. Let's jump down to verse 8. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but the prating fool shall fall. Jump down to verse 13. The lips of him that understandeth wisdom is found, but the rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Let's jump down to verse 14. A wise man lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near to destruction. Verse 17. He is in the way of life that keepeth instruction. Again, someone that follows directions. They're wise. Verse 18, He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. And verse 19, In the multitude of words there not, wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. It's a sport of a fool in verse 23. A sport of a fool to do mischief, mischief but the man of understanding hath wisdom. You know, just reading these few verses would make me as a man or a woman want to be wise. Look at all this. But digging into each of them, we can see that this attribute of wisdom also has a direct effect on our health, our wealth, and our happiness. Remember what we want? I want to be healthy. I want to be wealthy. I want to be happy. God says you need to be wise. So let's look at them. A wise man is teachable. Teachable there in verse 8. A wise heart receives commandments. Verse 14, wise man lay up, gather knowledge. Verse 17, he keepeth instruction, you follow directions. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to get it. And verse 18 and 19, he refraineth his lips is wise. He talks less and listens more. And how many of you would be uh, agreeable to, to agree with me that being teachable, listening, Understanding is the key to success. Whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether it's in your family, you know what? If you're not listening, if you're not teachable, you're not going to be successful. Amen. And so God came here and He said, you know what? If you're wise, 
It's one of the keys to success. And the proverb shows us that a wise man is teachable. The wise man also brings gladness to his family. I won't spend a lot of time here, but verse 1, a wise son maketh a glad father. We all have parents. How many of us would say it's easier for me to get something from mom and dad when they're happy with me? Yeah. My kids aren't stupid. They're four and six, and even now, they understand if I want something, ask dad when he's in a good mood. When I'm happy with them, they're more apt to get it. And you know what? God put that down on paper for us so we wouldn't forget it. A wise man, he makes his family happy. He makes a glad father. God knows the advantage of family. And with this one verse, he shows us the value of pleasing our parents. You know, a wise man also plans ahead. Verse 2, he that gathereth in the summer is a wise son. I read an article Recently, it was in Time Magazine, interviewed 17 successful people, billionaires and millionaires and CEOs and entrepreneurs, and it asked them a question, what do you think is the key to your success? You know, what do you wish you'd known? And, and really, this question was, what do you think that people should know in their 20s that you didn't know that you wish you had? And so these are people that have made it. They run companies. They have more money than I could ever imagine. And this is what they said. They said they'd wish they'd known in their 20s that it's important to save, to have a cushion, to manage debt. Verse 2, he that gathereth in the summer is a wise son. Manage your finances. Saving, doing those things, managing your debt. Even non-believers understand that sometimes things can go wrong and they plan ahead so that they can weather the storm without being broken. Wisdom is God's way of saying, you know what, plan for a rainy day. And it says, someone that plans, someone that saves, is wise. Wisdom also gives us uh, a, a contrast to understanding. And you say, those are the same thing. Well, I already said, wisdom is having experience, judgment, and knowledge. Understanding means that you have the ability to understand something. It's comprehension. It means you have insight and good judgment in each situation you fat, face. And you know what? A wise man can do both. A wise man says, you know what? I have... The, the knowledge, the understanding there, but I also have the comprehension. Verse 13, In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. And verse 23, A man of understanding hath wisdom. Understanding, wisdom. A man who's wise and who has understanding is going to have an advantage over every other person that he comes into contact with. Think about it. In school. On your job. Even walking down the street, if you have wisdom, if you have understanding, if you can comprehend, if you have a depth that you can actually understand something, you're going to have an advantage. In almost every facet of life, understanding's crucial, wisdom's crucial. It's necessary for success. And why is success important? Because we know it's true that success in life, whether it's on the job or in the exercise program or in the school or in your marriage or in raising kids or whatever it is, that success leads us to what three things? Health, wealth, and happiness. And I know it sounds repetitive. It's going to get even worse. But that's the key. We want these things. We can do what the world says and we can go chase books and we can try to climb the corporate ladder or we can go to the gym five hours a day, whatever it is. Or we can trust God. Live these four attributes, which we're going to talk about. And we can have health, wealth, and happiness. You know, greater health, greater wealth, increased happiness, all revolves, firstly, around wisdom. You want to be fit? Gain and employ wisdom and get fit. There's nobody here that's going to get fit without understanding what food to eat and how to exercise or that you need to exercise. It's that understanding, it's that wisdom that you have there. You want more money? Guess what? You need to gain and employ some wisdom to go through school, do well, get a better job, work hard, get some more money. You want to increase happiness in life? Guess what? Those first two things, you're healthier, you make more money. It's not always going to make you happier, but it's going to help. Gain and employ wisdom. Get to a place where you can do something that makes you happy. It's not always about money. Sometimes it's getting to a place where you have the freedom and the understanding and the wisdom to know, I'm willing to take lesser pay to do something that's more enjoyable. But it takes this wisdom 
And what am I saying here? I'm saying that gaining this wisdom, gaining this experience, increasing knowledge, utilizing good judgment is going to help you to be successful in your Christian life. Anybody remember the second one? The second one was righteousness. All right? Righteousness. What is righteousness? It's the quality of being morally right and justifiable. Also acting in accord with the divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. Jesus was righteous. But this is what this proverb is saying. is saying so many wonderful things about righteousness. And I think it's safe to say that everybody here understands that God prefers righteousness. In fact, He prefers righteousness so much that He sent His righteous Son down here to die on a cross for you and I so that we could look righteous in God's eyes. So we have this attribute of righteousness. When you're going through this proverb, it's not a surprise that we see the attribute of righteousness occurs most. We go through all of, of Proverbs 10. Righteousness appears more than any other. Let's go through them quickly. You know, Verse 2, righteousness delivereth from death. Verse 3, the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. Verse 9, he that walketh uprightly walketh surely. Verse 11, the mouth of the righteous man is a well of life. Verse 16, the labor of the righteous tendeth to life. Verse 21, the lips of the righteous feed many. 24, the desire of the righteous shall be granted. 25, the righteous is an everlasting foundation. 28, the hope of the righteous shall fall. Righteous shall be gladness. 29, the way of the Lord is strength to the upright. Verse 30, the righteous shall never be removed. And verse 32, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable. You know, taken together, God promises the righteous, that He's going to save them from hell. That's what those first couple verses that I read were. He's already done that. that his righteous Son came down. And you know what? If we accept that, He saves us from hell. It talks about not letting us famish. Famish to cause or suffer severely from hunger. Guess what? You're going to have enough to eat. He's not going to let you famish if you're living a righteous life. That gets to health. You know what? His way is to be sure, certain, predictable. His mouth, we're talking about you and I now. Our mouths, our words are going to be a well of life. They're going to be profitable to ourselves and others. A well of life, that's profitable. And God says, you know what, as a righteous person, if you have that attribute, you're going to be profitable. Again, what do we want? Health, wealth, happiness? We've already covered two. Just be righteous. You're going to have strength and you're going to have wealth. His labor is also going to be profitable to himself and others. God's going to grant him his desires there in verse 24. Desires, health, wealth, happiness. He's going to be stable. It's an everlasting foundation, never to be removed. And then look at this, verse 28. They're going to have glad, gladness. What's another word for gladness? Happiness. All right. This is just so cool. Verse 28, he's going to have gladness, gladness, happiness. Verse 29, he's going to have strength, health. Verse 32, he's going to know what is acceptable. Wisdom and knowledge again. And what does that wisdom and knowledge give us? More money. All right? Health, wealth, happiness. It all comes out of these Proverbs. All you need to do is follow these attributes. And the attribute of righteousness helps the Christian to be successful. Let's move on quickly. I don't want to run out of time this morning. The next one was diligence. Diligence. Diligence means to put forth constant and earnest effort to accomplish what is undertaking. Persistent exertion of the body and mind. Diligence means persistence and hard work. You know, pastors said it up here before. I've heard other people say it. You know what? The harder I work, the luckier I get. That's life. You want health, wealth, and happiness? You want to be successful in your Christian life? It takes diligence. It takes hard work. It takes you going the extra mile to do what you need to do. The bottom line is hard work's always going to pay off. I haven't met anybody in school or in work or in my family or in my church that says, you know what, it's going to pay to not do anything. Diligence, hard work, getting a job, that's what's going to pay off. And God puts it in this proverb. Verse 4, He becometh poor that dealeth to the slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Verse 5, he that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in the harvest is a son that causes shame. 
Verse 15, the rich man's wealth is a strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. 16, the labor of the righteous tendeth to life. And 26, as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the slugger to them that send him. You know, there's fewer verses in this proverb that talk about diligence. We had a lot in righteous. We had a lot in wisdom. There's fewer in diligence, but guess what? We shouldn't discount them. God's weaving us a picture here. Wisdom, righteousness, diligence, justness. If you do these things, you're going to be successful. So we need to look at them. And if you look at what they gain you, again, it kind of just weaves right in. So verse 4. You know, our diligence, our hard work leads to riches, prosperity. Alright, verse 15. Those diligence, the prosperity, that leads us to security, strong city, that life that happiness that we want. And if we go a little bit further, verse 16, that diligence, that labor, and that righteousness going together leads us to health, wealth, happiness. That's what it's about. And again, you can chase all the things the world wants or you can be the Christian God wants you to be, which is wise and just and righteous and diligent. And you can have a successful Christian life that gets you to the same place. You know, God gave us another example about diligence, and I just want to cover this quickly before I move on. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, you don't need to turn there. I'll read it for you. But it says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would would not work, neither should he eat. And I know we look at this and, and we use this to say, you know what, if you're a man, you need to get a job. If you're a, a person that, that needs some income, you need to get a job. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. But you know what, this isn't just talking about the world. This isn't just talking about the job out there in your secular environment. This is talking about working with whatever your hand findeth to do. That means you have a job in the church, do it. And God says, I'm going to take care of you. If you have a calling on your life, if you have a spiritual gift that you know about, use it with diligence. That's what God wants us to do. That's how we're successful Christians. And then the final attribute here, justness. To just is to be described as fair and equitable and right. To be just is to be guided by truth and reason and justice and fairness. And again, God rewards the just. God rewards the just. You know, there's some traits that go along that you could use to define um, justness. It's integrity, honesty, truthfulness. How many people on the job think they're going to get ahead if they have integrity, honesty, and truthfulness? That's how you're successful. I'm not going to hire somebody that doesn't have integrity, that's not truthful, and that's dishonest. And guess what? I'm not going to promote that person, and I'm not going to trust that person, and I'm not going to help that person succeed. But if they have integrity and if they have uh, truthfulness and if they are honest, you're going to get ahead. And God says He's going to reward that. Verse 6 there for justness. We're going to go through a few verses. Blessings are upon the head of the just. Verse 7, the memory of the just is blessed. Verse 19, in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Again, honesty, integrity, refraining your lips, sometimes not saying some things. 20, the tongue of the just is as choice silver. 27, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. And verse 31, the mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, and bringeth, but a forward tongue shall be cut out. You know, the qualities to success, again, in everything we do, honesty, integrity, truthfulness, that's justness. And I don't go out and say, man, I'm going to be a just person today. But you know what, on an application, sometimes I do say I'm honest and trustworthy. And we should, because there's a whole lot of people out there that aren't. And as a Christian, to be successful, it's these traits that God wants to see. They help us to be successful. And whether that success, whether again at work or at home or in our health or in our family, it all revolves around those things so we can be successful in the Christian life and have the health, wealth, and happiness we desire. So what does it mean? You know, the question we began with, is the Christian life worth it? Well, Brother Ryan, I don't ask that question. Yeah, you do. You ask it in here. 
I, you probably don't ask pastor. You probably don't share it with me. You may not even talk to your spouse. But I can guarantee you, all of us at some point in time are going to ask, is the Christian life worth it? And I'm not saying it's bad to ask the question, but I'm saying it's important how you answer it. Yes, it's worth it. We just looked through this entire proverb why it's worth it. God promises success. God promises health, wealth, happiness. God promises these things, but we have to live life His way. Again, every person in here desires those things. And don't sugarcoat it. There's not a person in here that if I said, you want $1,000, you wouldn't take it. There's not a person in here that I said, you want 10 more years of your life that you wouldn't take it. There's not a person in here that says, you know what, I just want to be unhappy today. I'm not going to take whatever you have that's going to make me happy. We want those things. And it's okay to desire those things, but we need to desire those things in a context that God wants us to have. You can do what the world says. You can take out those self-help books. You can try to climb the corporate ladder. You can try to make more money. And guess what? When you make more money, you can try to buy those things that make you healthy or happy. My wife and I were talking again about people and finances. and There's some people that just kind of confuse us. They have so much money, yet they're so unhappy. And you'd think, you'd watch them and they have the vacations and they have the clothes and they have the big house and they have the nice cars and they can go eat wherever they want and they can hire the housekeepers, amen? And they can do all these things. And you'd be like, man, that'd be the happiest person ever. If I had that, I don't even know. But they're not. Because that money tears them down and that success tears them down because they're not doing it God's way. So you can try to buy that enjoyment or whatever, or you can live the life that God expects us to live. Live the life that God has planned for you. A life of wisdom, righteousness, diligence, justness, which is going to lead to a Christian life that's well worth it. You know, we didn't talk about a whole lot of of out-of-this-world things this morning. We talked about some very basic things. Live the life Christ wants you to live, and He's going to help you be a successful Christian. And then it's not going to matter whether you have that health or that wealth, because you're going to be happy, because He's going to give you a joy that surpasses all understanding. He's going to be with you in that problem, and He's going to help you to be successful. He's going to reward you for your diligence. He's going to help you to understand what really matters. Wisdom, righteousness, justness, diligence lead to a successful life, a life full of victory. And while I can't say that it's always going to lead to better health or more wealth or greater happiness, I can say that you have a better shot at achieving all of those things if you do what God says to do than if you do what the world says to do. And I'm there. All right. I don't want you to think that I've got it figured out because I'm standing up here and I'm preaching it. I fight with this every day as I go to work. Well, if I did this, I could. Well, if I did that, I could. Well, if I just put in some extra here, maybe that. I understand. Because my flesh, it wants better health, more wealth. I want to be happier. I'm not saying I'm unhappy. That's just what we long for. But God said, I gave you a formula here in Proverbs 10. You want those things? Be a successful Christian. Be wise, be righteous, be just, be diligent. And if you do that, you're going to have a better shot than if you do anything else. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for this time and opportunity we have just to learn more from you, Lord. It was a simple lesson this morning, Lord, but it was important. Because I think many times that we do follow after the world in trying to gain those things but I know you have a better way. 